it complacency versus contentment complacency and contentment are powerful actions that have been debated in many situations to quantify them as an emotional or a mental status for an individual additionally throughout the bible scriptures in both the old and new testament tells how both actions regardless of their quantification determines the fruits of the spirit in each person who professes a love and commitment to the christianity worldview and a belief in christ as believers in christ there should always be a balance in our walk with the lord although our faith teaches us to pray and have faith this does not provide us with an excuse to sin and find complacency in our walk with Christ. Many believers believe that once we receive Christ as our savior, we faithfully attend church, we are fulfilling our obligation to Jesus Christ, and our work of salvation is being fulfilled with weekly service attendance, paying offerings and tithes, or being a member of a church auxiliary. However, complacency is discouraged in the Bible as a, a Christian. First, Jesus mandated that each believer reach out to others and proclaim to people who did not know or understand why Christ became a living sacrifice for the sins and rebellions of humanity. It was Christ's proclamation to his disciples to go ye all into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's found in Mark 16th and 15th verse. This is meant to be a rally cry with an urgency and joy to share great news of redemption and healing to people who are lost or hurting in their circumstances. People are looking for answers in the 21st century with little help with finding a solution. Barna provides a statistic that reveals the growth surge in people seeking spirituality and purpose with no relief. Many believers in Christ find themselves loving Jesus but not the church because of the surge of the pagan or non-Christian practices seem to provide more answers relating to health, wellness, life, purpose, and contentment. Barna reveals statistically that people are willing to redefine God as having multiple paths to wholeness and inner peace. In today's society, spiritual complacency is largely fueled by our propensity to rely on technology for instant access and personal gratification through instant messaging or direct messaging and group acceptance by using social apps that distract us from the true mission of our faith or our willingness to uphold the standards of holiness and godliness. I'm reminded of a scripture that seems fitting to put into perspective that the opportunity that each believer has when we utilize social media. The scripture reads, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when we defame you as evil doers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. First Peter, third chapter, 15th and 16th verse. It is important that our conduct and our overall character gives glory to God and reveals evidence of love and a living example of Christ's teaching that resembles the Beatitudes of blessings and grace. Oftentimes, social media is used as a weapon that destroys the witness of the saints because of the overindulgences of prideful responses in the form of likes. These are deceptive 
assurances because a person can actually like what you have posted. However, they may not like you or your profession of faith. Therefore, we are leaving ourselves open to spiritual attack from negative forces that are assigned to attack your Christian walk. This sometimes happens when a person questions your walk with Christ or questions your hope joy, faith, and belief in salvation. Peter tells us that we must first sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that we are to consecrate our hearts and set our hearts or emotions and thoughts apart from the approvals and acceptance of the non-believer's opinion regarding our reasons to love Christ and accept him as our personal Savior. Also, when we do this, there has to be evidence of change and renewing through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that show the Spirit of God working in all facets of our lives, especially on social media where old friends or relatives monitor our page for discrepancies with our walk with Christ. If they are non-believers, they are working as agents of Satan whom the Bible says seeks out people to devour their testimony of faith and salvation through Jesus Christ. Each believer in Christ must be aware that their test of faith and salvation is never ending and always being revealed in our in your lives. It is not good for any of us to become complacent to understanding that our personal actions can hurt our testimony and cause others to stop believing that the saving grace of Jesus Christ can change us from the inside out. Many of us become complacent in our walk with the Lord because we have not fully internalized all that God has done for us. Waking up every morning is a part of giving thanks, having our health and ability to move and think for ourselves are other true reasons to offer our lives as living sacrifices. These recognitions are only relevant to the believer that believes God is creator of all things in the heavens and earth, and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the creator of all things in heaven and earth. And finally, that the Holy Spirit leads us, comforts us, and teaches us how to to live a consecrated and sanctified life. Complacency only opens us up to demonic attacks of temptations that call upon the hedonistic nature of man to ideologically seek gratification and prideful acknowledgement from peers and others. You know, every person has the privilege to own and carry some sort of mobile or or portable device at all times. There are great advantages of having technology at the touch of your fingers at all times. One major advantage is a person's ability to call for help in an emergency and to reach a loved one almost instantaneously. Also, mobile devices have presented a great case for necessity and value for all persons from all walks of life. Social media and technology allow the end user access to all sorts of information that persuades its reader to believe that much of its information was once hidden or never before seen as new information and groundbreaking. But many of the subscribers that and saints of social media cannot differentiate from what is true or false. Many false teachers and propaganda outlets have used tools like these to cast doubt on many of the established foundational beliefs that previously laid the foundations of faith, freedom, love, and family in others. Thinking naturally and believing in what's tangible has slowly eroded society's ability to have faith or to believe in a higher power. 
naturalism had become a major philosophy with overarching tethers of influences that allow a person through social media to easily share false teachings and disproven theories to masses of people with just a tweet, a post, a text, or DM. Also, fake news and staged videos seem to be the regular news of deception and destruction. You know, naturalism and nat- naturalistic theories are the basis of pride that every false teacher or cultic religion has to gain its footing in the heart and minds of the people. Modern thinkers are people who who use social media and videos or podcasts to send countless hours of teachings and philosophies to keep their listeners empowered to believe that they are kings and queens and gods of their own destiny and a person who does not need a higher accountability to their moral and ethics. There are four basic beliefs of modern thinkers and what they believe to be the new truth that was hidden and through its revelation. It supersedes Christianity and anything supernatural or spiritual. Naturalism is the ideal or belief that only natural i.e. as opposed to supernatural or spiritual uh, laws and forces operate in the world. People that believe in naturalism, uh, like naturalists, they assert that natural laws are rules that govern the structure and behavior of the natural universe. That the changing universe at every stage is a product of these laws. This philosophy openly and willingly establishes complacency in the modern culture to believe that only what is naturally and physically explained should be taken as truth and real. Bush provides us with these four basic beliefs that fuse this thinking. Number one, mankind evolved from animals. Number two, The human mind and human behavior are therefore directly influenced by our animal ancestry. Number three, all of reality is subject to naturalistic scientific investigation. Number four, truth is discoverable of at least confirmable by and only by the naturalistic scientific method of research. However, if we examine the four points that naturalists are trying to convey, we can see where they are in complete agreement with eliminating any acknowledgement of divinity or the need for a savior. Thus, this allows for the influences of the Antichrist spirit to manipulate the hearts and minds of people so greatly until it will fool even Bible-believing Christians into thinking that we can incorporate naturalism and Christianity as one true holistic interfaith belief system. Mm. Complacency can be avoided in our Christian walk through the incorporation of spiritual disciplines. Whitney articulates that spiritual disciplines are practices found in scripture that promotes spiritual growth among believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are the habits of devotion and experiential Christianity that have been practiced by the people of God since biblical times. Every Christian must find a way to grow in our faith and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us how to live a holy life and a life that produces evidence of being spiritually, emotionally, and mentally changed by his indwelling. This has to be a paramount perception of who we want to be and how we want to live. This cannot be done within ourselves because there will be times of fallacies 
and doubt that will allow the influences of negative thinking or evil notions to come into our minds and hearts to steer us away from providing a living example of love and hope to others. In the Bible, Paul was addressing the men of Athens at the Areopagus, and notice the Athenian objects of worship during a religious ceremony and came across an inscription for worship to the unknown God. This allowed Paul to expound on the divinity of God and that this particular God that was unknown to them was quite known and very much alive. Also, the significant information that Paul wanted to convey to them was, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives us all life and breath. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The scripture is found in Acts 17th chapter 22nd through the 31st verse. Paul is talking about Jesus. Jesus is that man whom God has ordained. Just like Paul in AD 52, when he spoke to the Athenians, we must be willing to share our understanding of God in Christ by allowing the Holy Spirit to help us share our experiences with people who do not know God. Just like Paul, we must be willing to be a vessel of holiness and love to receive the Holy Spirit's guidance to draw non-believers through our witness and walk. Paul was used by the Holy Spirit to draw some of the men of Athens to hear more, and some of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is why it's important that we allow Holy Spirit to teach us how to decrease our natural emotions and mentality and surrender our hearts and minds to Holy Spirit so that he can reveal the truth and answers of salvation and deliverance to the people who are being drawn to the message. Finally, complacency quenches the functions of the Holy Spirit because he is not allowed to use the testimonies of the believers as evidence of God's grace by being justified of salvation through faith if we no longer seek to have a personal relationship with God. Evidence of complacency in our lives looks very similar to how the Athenians lived during Paul's day. They believed that their God was made of man's hands and was made of gold, silver, wood, or stone. Just like today, it, complacency, should not be in the church because it compels believers to start worshiping things made of silver, such as money and wealth, gold, such as prosperity and valuable things that are priceless, wood, such as our jobs, houses, and property, church structures, 
and stone our likeness and mega structures of possessions and our pride and ego. Our desire to be liked as well as have friends and most of all our willingness to usurp God's plan for our lives just to be popular. Complacency can only be eliminated from a person's heart through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and a total surrender to being born again through the wholehearted commitment to walk and accept holiness by the transformation and renewing of your minds and hearts in Jesus Christ. Contentment is a point in the life of a believer that means They are resting in the arms of God's love, mercy, and grace. Hebrews 13, chapter 5, tells us, Let your conduct be be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What is covetousness? Well, the best way to put it in perspective how covenantness is very harmful is to give an example that a person is resting in the fact that God loves and provides for them to the point that they are no they are no longer willing to do anything else but stay in that place never growing or helping others but themselves and regardless of the cost words that explain covenantness are Uh, According to the dictionary, it says inordinately or wrongly desirous of wealth or possessions, greedy, eagerly desirous, acquisitive, avid, eager, gluttonous, itchy, jealous, keen, mercenary, rapacious, ravenous, selfish, closed fists grabby and piggish you see born again believers according to Hebrews 13 and 5 outlines a great blueprint of character lists that reveal the heart of a person who has not fully embraced and surrendered to walking in the contentment of God's ability to supply all of their needs and give us peace that surpasses all of our understanding. First Timothy, the fourth, seven, fourth chapter and seventh verse also tells us, discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. It is important to understand that our ultimate mark and press toward in Christ Jesus as a believer is godliness. This cannot be achieved unless you are born again and renewed in Christ Jesus through the infilling and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Our major question to ask daily are spelled out in these 11 words. What shall I render unto God for his mercies and goodness? What can I give to God for the blessings and peace, for the goodness and health, for the mercy and abundance of grace, for God's love? We should be allowed to rest in the arms of Christ, knowing that he's got our back. Jesus told us that he was going to be with us always. And Paul stressed the fact that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The Bible was very succinct in telling us to stay connected with our source and help, which comes from God. He wants to be the source that provides and teaches us how to be blessed so that we can bless others. Jesus was a primary example of giving when he was faced with addressing the needs of 5,000 and then 7,000 people in the scriptures. Jesus was successful with feeding the people who were following him and learned about the kingdom of God. You know, we cannot overlook this great example of love and giving when regardless of how it may appear on the surface, 
God through his son because Jehovah Yireh is the Lord that provides. Another story in the Bible talks about how Jesus and his disciples were invited to a wedding in Cana. John mentioned this as an affirmation to the, the future readers of Christ's divinity over all things natural and spiritual. The Bible tells us that Jesus turned water into wine. This is the first documentation of his signs and it revealed his glory. How awesome to know that a recorded miracle turn of wa- turning water into wine was recorded and witnessed by more than one person. Many of us still believe that our individual selves can provide for ourselves and we do not need the help or any help from Jesus. The first of his signs in Cana of Galilee was written to help us understand that miracles and signs and wonders doesn't happen when a person wishes it to happen. Signs and wonders are normally the result of God's plan to reveal that he is omnipotent. Mary, Jesus' mother, must have seen him perform miracles and signs and wonders prior to this time in order for her to go to ask him to make wine. Although Jesus did tell her that it wasn't his time yet to reveal his divinity to mankind, he acted in obedience to his mother. Jesus thought of the possibility of helping people to keep the wedding feast festive and joyous. He continued to turn the six previously used water pots filled with water that the visitors used after the manner of purifying the Jews. This water was used to wash the hands and the feet of each visitor who entered from the street as a preparation of cleansing themselves. Jesus understood that this would truly be a remarkable allegorical opportunity for the servants to see how something that is meant to be dismissed and discarded, overlooked and ignored after its use to become something excellent, wonderful, and pleasing to all. Telling them to combine the water meant that the servants would be able to see all of the impurities that were in the water. The servant may have seen dirt particles and other things that were normally looked at as truly worthy of throwing away. But Jesus... When he saw the impurities, he was able to change the contents of the impurities with a simple action. These actions are the same actions that the Lord takes with us when we are standing before him, depressed, angry, and dismissed. He wants us to see in this story that nothing is lost in Christ Jesus. Externally, it may appear to others that our feelings and faith can be discarded or our lifestyle and social status can put us in a lower position as others. But Jesus wants us to know that he can change all circumstances to his will. Mary made a simple request and Jesus answered the simplest request at the party. As he was there with his mother when the host ran out of wine, Immediately, Mary, his mother, went to him and made her request known. When the owner came to Mary, she told him that whatever he says to do, do it. Jesus turned water into wine, and the Bible tells us that the miracle wine was considered to be the best for the last. You know, even though Mary was Jesus' mother, she still needed to build a relationship with him to see who he was as a man. You know, as a youth, Jesus was able to heal a bird, make crops grow, and help the sick prior to this point. And Mary was there to see the inner divinity of Christ in her child. 
Also, Mary was already told by the angel Gabriel that she was going to bear a son named Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. And that's found in Matthew, the first chapter, 21st verse. You know, God looks at sin and rebellion as dirt and uncleanliness of people who harbor these thoughts or actions in their heart. It is the impurities in the heart and mind that prohibit us from having a loving and lasting relationship with Jesus Christ. Rebellion and disobedience separates us from God's mercy and love. Just as the servant needed to pour the dirty water into another water pot, believing and surrendering to Jesus as Savior allows the purification process to begin in the individual. The redemptive acceptance of salvation through grace by faith, when we are approached by the Christ, has to initiate an overarching desire to be different from the life and character that a person portrays to others after they have encountered Jesus. Paul again tells us that we must present our bodies as living sacrifices, meaning change and shifting must take place in order for the power of a miracle status transformation to take place. It was Paul's Understanding that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. That's found in Romans 12, chapter the first verse. Contentment helps us to trust, and trust gives us strength to have faith. And when all natural indicators say that we should give up or everything is hopeless. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Contentment helps us to go on autopilot and trust that in all things, God is in all things. We can only be content in God When we are fully involved and committed to developing our spiritual disciplines. Again, Whitney points out that spiritual disciplines are activities, not attitudes. Disciplines are practices, not character qualities, graces or fruit of the spirit that are found in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 22nd and 23rd verse. Disciplines are things you do, such as read, meditate, pray, fast, worship, serve, and learn. Therefore, although we are resting in God, we are not stagnant or unproductive in our relationship building with God. All things that grow has a relationship. Plants have a relationship with dirt. Dirt has a relationship with water. Water has a relationship with the sun. The sun has a relationship with man. And man has a relationship with God. Christians must always know that God wants a relationship with each of us individuals. God said that he knows the hairs on our head. That's found in Luke 12, chapter 6 through the 8th verse. God foreknew you before you were born. And that's found in Romans, the 8th chapter, 29th to the 30th. And he specifically told the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to all the nations. It is so important that we build a relationship with God. Resting in him helps us grow and revealed the mightiness of God as a healer of sickness, a provider, and a comforter in times of trouble. You know, isn't it awesome to know God? However, we have to ask ourselves a life-changing question that requires total transparency and humility. And the question is, does the Most High God no me.